one of the best kept secrets in American history. Between 1854 and 1929, over 250,000 orphans and surrendered children were taken out of New York City and put on trains and given away at train stations in every state in the United States. An amazing story. I don't know if you heard about it. I found out, you know, maybe a decade ago or something about the riders of the orphan train. Orphans, 250,000 or so. It's amazing. All right, I have experts here who have made this sign of their life mission, I'm thinking. So, Allison Moore, great to have you on. You're a great to be here. humanities scholar mm -hmm. and also project director for Riders of the Orphan Train. And then Phil Lancaster, singer-songwriter that added a whole new dimension to the story of the orphans yes. uh, around this rider train. So this is so fascinating. Tell us about what were the orphan trains? In uh, 1854, they started sending children out, trying to clear out the orphanages and children on the streets and also children from impoverished single parent families. They put them on trains. The idea was to send them out to new homes that people in the developing West must have an extra room um, place at the table. But so they were adopting them permanently out to these No, they families? were taking them in. Most were not oh, actually really? adopted. They were just taking them in. Like a foster program. Right. It was pre-foster Very care. creative. Mm -hmm. And these came mostly from New York, did they? Philadelphia? Principally New York? from New York City okay. because there were two different organizations that were working with these children. The Children's Aid Society and the Catholic Foundling Hospital. So those two organizations placed out so many children, we kind of always focused the orphan trains as being from New York City. And well, and they weren't, as, as you mentioned, always, you know, adopted out, not mm -hmm. always. Some of these children weren't actually orphans either. No. no, they were, had one living parent who simply had to give them up because they could not work and raise the child at the same time. So these children were lined up on station platforms or meeting halls, opera houses, and people would come and pick and choose which ones they wanted. And then if you weren't picked, you got back on the train, went down to the next stop. I tell you, that had to be frightening, you know, kind of um, debilitating emotionally as well. What if they didn't pick you? What if you kept riding the train and, you know, you didn't know? And then where do they take them? They went along a train line, so it wasn't an orphan train. This was any passenger train going anywhere. And so they would simply make the stops that that particular, the Rock Island line or whatever it was, made. And if the child was not chosen by the end of it, they would go back to New York, maybe back to an orphanage and try again later. They were sent out to every state in the continental U.S. So every state received these children, different states uh, receiving sometimes a lot more and sometimes very few, like only 236 have been uh, counted in Arkansas, where I came from, whereas a place like Texas or Ohio received in the thousands of children. Amazing. In Arizona, we got Arizona, some here in Arizona. Got some. Yes, yes, you did. How it? many did we get? Do we well, know? <laughs> we, we only know of the 22 children that were sent to Clifton in 1904 by the uh, Catholic Foundling Hospital. And that r resulted in a big controversy that ended up in the Arizona Supreme Court. Arizona was still a territory then, but these children were taken into Hispanic homes by, uh, because they were the Catholics in the town. They happened to come from the New York Foundling Hospital stipulation. They had to be raised Catholic. So the French priests that took this on didn't really understand you know, the cultural uh, difficulties of the territory. And so uh, there was a vigilante group that went out and, and gathered up all of these children in the middle of the night and held them all hostage in the Morency Hotel. Good heavens, and a little drama with this. It was well. a big drama. And uh, yeah. it uh, resulted in a book called The Great Arizona Orphan Abduction by Linda Gordon. Ah. Man, I think that's the one I read. You know, it's Probably. been a long time ago. Absolutely fascinating. Now, you have a book out also, Allison. It's a historical novel called Riders on the Orphan Train, and it takes place in 1918. I created two composite characters based on interviews that I did with a lot of orphan train riders. Phil and I started in 1997 when there were still so many. Uh, alive, and we went to national reunions and met them. So you heard their stories. We well, did. speaking of stories, we have just a little clip of a picture of a girl, and then it's her story. Mm -hmm. So let's take a little look at uh, that video of this young girl and how it impacted her on the orphan train. Dear Mr. Brace, 
When I lived in New York, I had no bonnet, and now I have more bonnets than I can wear, and I get no whippings, and I have a father and mother and brothers and sisters here, and they are kinder to me than my own ever were. I think I will never be happier than I am now. I want to credit uh, the filmmaker Janet Graham and Ed Gray, who did this for the American Experience. It was called The Orphan Trains. It was first uh, shown in 1995, and they allow us to use excerpts from it's it. It's fabulous. And when you go on your website, which we have on the screen mm -hmm. off and on, um, they can see this whole mm -hmm. video, which is very, very touching. And the story was amazing. OK, so music. You've been touring this since for like 20 years or something. 20 years. Yeah, amazing. So why music too? Phil, you're kind of the musician guy, right? Allison and I met at the Kerrville Folk Festival in 1997. So after she told me about the Orphan Trains and we both kind of discovered this together, what happened was we collaborated together to write some songs about the Orphan Trains and so we can probably do one here for you now. I think that would be great. Take it away, Allison Moore and Phil Lancaster. Thank you. It's Two. called Maybe This Town. Three, four. Forty-seven children, same suitcase in hand, waiting on the platform. They're trying to understand why the train was taking us to towns we did not know. Hell's Kitchen's kids and brand new. Some strangers take us home. We rode south and west for days. Some cried themselves to sleep. The cradle rocked on iron wheels. And the papers hard to keep. They said that we'd see Indians and ponies running wild. But the Indians were living in the towns and the ponies tied the wells. Maybe this town will. Our teeth, they feel our arms when they can't be set for God. But the kindness of strangers that came both near and far to take our hands inside their own, well, they want us as we are. Maybe this town will be my home. Maybe someone would call my name. Maybe I'll be That's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> I love that. It's so emotional when you put music, like our sculptor was saying, when you put music to things, the art, the imagination, it's beautiful. Now, this is just like 12 minutes, so we have together, but you two will be performing tomorrow at the Prescott Valley Public Library, or Prescott Public Library, sorry, at 2 o'clock. Yes. And you have an hour program, mm -hmm. and you'll be talking about this, and people can actually ask questions and things. Yes. Right, right? It's a combination of uh, historical photographs projected behind us, uh, while we sing. There's two interviews with uh, Orphan Train writers, and uh, I do a reading from my novel, and then we do a question and answer, and that's really the interesting right. part for us because sometimes people will show up who are descendants of Orphan Train writers. Oh, amazing, of course, and then your music, and what a great thing. So again, 2 o'clock tomorrow at our Prescott Library. Public Library, and then Prescott Valley Public Library, February 15th, you'll be back right. at 6 yes, p.m. We Wonderful. And right. we had the tour schedule, so there's all over Arizona right. yes. this month and through yeah. February. So. 
And That's it's great. funded by the Arizona Humanities Council, and their mission really is to have uh, programming for the public that reminds people of what it's like to be human in today's That's world. Wonderful. And the historical context of the orphan train riders is really a story that touches all of our lives. It's a big one. Social and historical had a lot of impact mm -hmm. around the nation. Yeah on all these children too. Why did you two get passionate about it? I mean, you, you met after you were both interested in it, but why, why so passionate about this? You've been touring for 20 years. Because we found out after Allison uh, told me about it a little bit and we watched the PBS documentary, the Orphan Train Heritage Society of America was five miles away from where I lived. I was living in Fayetteville, Arkansas. They were in Springdale, Arkansas, so we got in touch with them and we were part of a reenactment and a 10th year anniversary where we met 11 orphan train riders back in 1997. Okay. So once we got involved like that, it was just normal to just want to know more and more and more. It was a fascinating thing. I don't think they'd ever done that before or since. No. Of course, it went on for 70-something years. 76 yeah. years. 76 right. years. Yeah. And we became their outreach program, and today we're the official educational outreach program for the National Orphan Train Complex Museum in Kansas. Wow, fabulous. People can actually visit that. So, writers of the Orphan Train Project, books, music, the speech tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Allison Moore and Phil Lancaster, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Wonderful.